okay, are we here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, that was shocking. Woo! Take it away, Mike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good morning, everybody, and or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, so my name is Mike Patty, and I'm the founder of Cinesamples and Museo. And so I thought real quick, some of you are new to what Museo is, and some of you have been using it for a long time. So I, I, th I thought I'd just start explaining basically what it is uh, and how it came about, and then we'll move on from there. So Cinesamples, uh, many, I think many of you are probably users of Cinesamples, which we started about 16 years ago. Uh, and we're sort of the LA uh, sampling company and sampled a lot of instruments uh, all, all over the LA area, the Sony scoring stage, the Alfred Newman scoring stage, um, and then other stages across around the world, actually. And so um, that was happening for a long time, but we decided a few years back that we saw that there were some problems. Uh, we wanted to be able to serve customers a lot better. And the main issue for especially younger people that were getting started was the the price point of getting uh, of getting these instruments. And you know, you could spend thousands of dollars just to kind of get started. Um, and there's a lot of great companies, not just Cine samples and I mean Spitfire orchestral tools, all these guys do great stuff. Uh, but the problem is how do you where do you get started? And so that's kind of what birthed the idea of Museo. So the challenge is um, we had to build our own sampler, our own delivery platform. It's uh, we deliver all the instruments right within your DAW. Um, so, but that's important. So that's solved the, like the first problem we need to solve was the price. And the second thing was the ability to create instruments really quickly um, because that allows us to serve people a lot faster not only making instruments and delivering them to you, but being able to change things on the fly and do updates. Uh, I know it sounds like a trivial thing, but with other sampler formats, it's very difficult to deliver these updates. And sometimes people, they don't want to deal with updates. They don't want to have to like go to native access or something and have to do all of that. So we have this whole um, uh, uh, versioning system that's in Museo. So I mean, I would say those are probably the two things. There's a bunch of other problems that we wanted to solve. But so what we did is we took the team here, uh, took 16 years worth of instruments that we sampled uh, since 2007. Uh, we're talking, you know, enormous investment. We did the math. It's in the two to three million dollar range, what it would cost to sample all of these instruments at Sony and all of this. And we took it all, ported it uh, into Museo and unifying all the instruments, making sure that they all uh, you know, um, would work in a, in a streamlined way. And, um, and that's where we are today. So we launched it earlier this year, and now we're like, we've got nearly all the CineSample stuff in there. And the key switches are almost all in there. I just saw uh, Santiago, who's on our team, he is putting the rest of the, the Cine Symphony key switches in. and. Uh, we're we're on we're on the right track, and we're, we're you know look we're a small team, and we're knocking this out as fast as possible. And so, anyway, that's my rambling. Um, so let me just introduce you real quick. So Shane Shane Roberts is our head of music production, musio production. Uh, he basically his job is to oversee all of the instrument porting and creation in Musio, um, uh, as well as sort of the user interface design, along with Maddie. Maddie's a, a huge part of that. Uh, and then Harrison is our lead uh, software engineer, uh, which is obviously very important. Uh, and then uh, Steve is Steve Goldstein is our head of customer service. And so if you've ever emailed <laughs> Cine samples over the last several years or Museo, most likely you're talking to Steve. And uh, yeah, so why don't we go ahead and take some questions from you all. So we're gonna we're streaming to a, a few places. Looks like it was a YouTube, Facebook, and X. Well, we we might not be doing that. So, <laughs> well, yeah. YouTube for sure. We'll, we're good we'll... at making music technology. We're not super good at using live stream technology. <laughs> so give us a little bit of a moment. We're all trying to come back from illnesses and travel and things like that. So this will end up on all those platforms. But for now, I think we're just streaming oh, okay. here to YouTube. So, yeah. Sorry uh, about. We... That. 
we have a user asking a really great starter question. Um, where can a user find the roadmap of instruments and updates for the rest of the year and what's to come in 2024? It's a great question. Uh, I guess I can answer that. So museo.com will have answers to all those questions. Uh, museo.com at the very top bar, there's a couple of really useful things. One is the roadmap going forward, where we have just some kind of near upcoming libraries and collections that we're going to, that we're are currently uh, being worked on to put in the museo. But the other thing is the live catalog. A lot of people don't know that we have a live catalog on, on museo.com. If you click on it, you can go and listen to the previews of all of the instruments and see exactly what's inside of museo. Um, we've done our very best. I, the, I want to say this at the beginning, I understand our community. They're like, they're, they're being cagey about what's in there or what's not and whatever. We can't really like throw out books and books of lists when we send an email out, you know, in a marketing format. So what we did was we wanted to make sure that everybody knew absolutely everything about what we're going to do and what we already have in there. So if you go to museo.com live catalog, you can literally click through the catalog as if you were in the museo app and hear previews of every single instrument that we have in there. So, um, that's where you can find all that info, museo.com. Or just ask. <laughs> We're pretty talkative. <laughs> Obviously, we've, we've got some talkers in the room and we all like to we all like to chat about it. Can we speak a little bit on some updates that we're excited for and looking forward to getting out there, things that are in the works? Yeah, yeah. So I um, mean, the first one that I'm like super excited about, we've got a bunch of stuff in the works right now that's in beta and kind of percolating. But I was just up like all night last night tweaking the Iceland uh, World Series library that we just kind of put out. It went through beta, we've pushed a bunch of stuff live, but I went through last night and I redid like a ton of stuff. I expanded ranges across the board, um, fixed sample starts, a couple of reported bugs that I didn't catch before. Uh, I left the country for a couple of weeks and oh my gosh, that collection is just like so inspiring. It's so unique. There's so much cool tones in there that I've never heard before. Strings and percussion and all sorts of stuff. So um, heard all the feedback yeah, that we got. Go ahead. Ken. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty cool. Like over the last year, so on a personal note, my family and I, we, we sold all our, our house and stuff and we actually traveled the world and we thought, well, we're in these countries. And so we, we sampled instruments in four countries, Iceland, Ireland, uh, Scotland, and South Africa. And we uh, connected with musicians there and the studios there to capture, you know, what we think is an authentic sound from these places. And um, well, so selfishly, we had a blast doing it. Um, but some of the stuff that came out of there is really awesome. We got a choir in in South Africa. We've got obviously, you know, all the stuff you would want from Ireland and Scotland. Bagpipes. Be and stuff. Yeah. Speaking of choirs, that's another thing of the Iceland session that um, is going to come out as a separate collection. But it's called Women of the North, and it's basically Nordic vocals, but women this time. And um, it's kind of a companion library to Men of the North. So lots of normal articulations and vowels with, you know, sustains and shorts and stuff, but also just an incredible suite of like effects and textures and all sorts of like guttural, creepy kind of things that people can do with their vo voices. And um, it was just a fantastic group of women who came and sang. And um, I was talking to Santiago, one of our producers the other day, and he was saying that when they were there in the session, we were talking to the choir and they were saying, look, Iceland is like a very small country and it has a very, very small singing community. So, you know, the 12 or 15 people that are here singing have been singing with each other since they were four years old. It's mothers and daughters and cousins and friends who just have been professionally singing together. So it's not like a lot of sessions in L.A. We sort of cobble together a group of people and they're all professionals and, and excellent musicians. So, you know, we get good results. But in this session, They've just been singing together forever, which is so important with vocals. And um, I've just been finishing up the legatos this last week, uh, which I think is actually the last thing to do on those libraries. Maddie and I have been kind of hammering it out this last week. And uh, you can tell they've been singing together for decades because it's just a beautiful sound. They're so blended. The tone is perfect. The tuning is so easy, you know, all that stuff. So excited about Iceland, excited about getting my teeth into Africa sessions once I get mixes back this next week. Um, more than that features. I'm a key switch guy and we just implemented key switching a couple weeks back. 
And um, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule for getting sort of the rest of the library key switch compatible. That's that's what a lot of the production team's time goes to. It's not just making new stuff, but it's building in support for features that Harrison uh, just finished rolling out. So it's a massive amount of work, but I think we've got like 500 instruments with UI updates in the library and something like 35 collections now or something like that that'll have key switching by the end of the month or something like that. It's it's significant. So we're we're moving forward on that front and I'm excited to have the whole library conforming to those features. Awesome. Uh, we've got a great question asking about um, just the the marketplace that we've been creating Museo for and what percentage are uh, professionals versus hobbyists uh, versus students and how we the discussions we've been having internally about how we can serve all of those different segments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would say it's about half and half. So that's why, you know, we, we made this pricing model that's very flexible. So there is subscription, which believe it or not, actually the number of people that subscribe um, significantly outnumber those that uh, sign up for the perpetual, but we also offer the perpetual for people that are professionals that just want to, you know, pay for it once and not have to deal with it. Um, so that's, it's, I would say kind of split down the middle. It's always hard to tell what defines a professional and what defines, uh, you know, an amateur. Um, but there is a large group of, of, you know, younger composers who are kind of just starting out and, uh, there aren't many options out there for, for where to start without yeah. having to spend a lot of money. Yeah, I think I'd I'd enter Let's another talk. yeah another group of people should probably enter the chat, which is students. Yeah, um, I mean they're they're sort of the middle ground between a professional and an amateur. They're certainly not someone who's just doing it as a hobby, and maybe they're not making a ton of money or you know paying their bills with music yet. But uh, we have an excellent education discount and program. Steve, you want to talk about that and how we've seen like so many people sign up with that and request. Sure. Yeah. So we offer a an educational license for students and educators. It's forty nine dollars for a one year license. This is different from a subscription because you have to submit your confirmation that you're that you still have academic status, which expires when you're when you graduate from being a student or if you leave your your teaching job. At that point, the subscription and perpetual license options are still available to you to purchase normally and all of the same projects and sessions and things that you've been working with uh, on the educational side work the same. It's the same app and same content and everything. Uh, and there's no restrictions on the, the usage of them. There's no, you know, no restriction on uh, commercial use of, of uh, the software in, in projects, which some companies do with their, their student discount. They'll offer a steep discount for a student, but you can't technically make any money from it. Um, that's, that's not, uh, we don't think that that's a, a equitable approach. And so we, uh, we built this with students in mind and with people who are just getting started and not just formally students, not just people who are officially uh, enrolled. Those are people, you, you do need a formal academic status in order to qualify for the discount, but in terms of the philosophy of how we built it and how we how we designed and developed these sounds, we created this with the intention of it being for people who are unfamiliar with what an oboe sounds like in isolation. They've never been to, you know, a, a recital of, of, you know, hearing a, a contrabass flute in, you know, by itself, or they've never had the opportunity to work with professional quality samples of, of instruments that may be a little bit more obscure or may have a little bit more nuance and, and specific writing techniques that you need to use. And to be able to explore that and understand that and, and learn how to develop your skills in orchestrating and composing and developing themes and mixing and all of these things that professionals are always working on their craft. There's not, it, it's not like anyone reaches a point where, okay, I'm done learning stuff about how, how these things work. I have I, learned I, composing. I, <laughs> yes, I know enough. Yeah. I'm done. That's that we, I hope no one actually ever, ever thinks that way uh, because you're wrong if you do. But I think the, uh, the evolution of Museo and the way that we've designed it to be constantly expanding and, and with a, a broad vision that, that Mike has of eventually having any instrument, any sound available with, within you search for literally any sound in, in Museo and you'll find it. Uh, obviously we're, we're, a long way from infinity, but that's definitely what we're what we're marching to. And I think that's something that that students in particular 
if you know, I if I had had access to this when I was when I was studying at you know years ago, it would have been a game changer for me. So well, and the students on our team say that. I mean, yes. we're we're not all high in the cloud people, you right. know, trying to give something for people we don't understand. We have three students on our team who are currently making music, or I guess Amanda just graduated with her <laughs> and her master's. Like, oh, okay, so. great. They all graduated. They, all graduated. <laughs> they were they were students earlier this year. They were students <laughs> earlier this year. And um, I, just to bring it back to the original question about like who is this for and stuff, um, I, I think there's a financial shift that's happening where we've we've gotten accustomed to orchestral samples and libraries costing X amount of dollars or within X amount of range. And there's a perception of like, if I only spend $200 on orchestral samples, am I really getting the best? Is it really the top quality? And like Mike said, we've we've been, we've got a 16 year history. We've invested millions of dollars and we've made millions of dollars off of these things. And the other day he said in a leadership meeting, he's like, look, we've already made our money. Like let's, let's change the game here and let's give access to more people. And um, that's what we're striving to do. So as a professional, if you can pay $10 a month and get access to extremely high quality sounds and absolutely professional libraries, please do that. <laughs> it's, it's not cheaper because it's, they're not chopped down. They're not, you know, cut down versions. They're not light versions of our contact instruments. Some of the functionalities are maybe not there or, or are intentionally are left out, but these are the right samples. They are played with an excellent engine and a sampler that's so light on the system. I mean, this is professional stuff. We've just done a good job, I think, making it accessible to students and amateurs and people at all levels, not only financially, but in a simple interface that's just streamlined. So that's kind of our approach to the professional amateur level. We want everyone to use it, but we're considering both very in, uh, intentionally in our design other, and in our production. One of the other market segments that we're excited to reach and have more availability with is the producer segment, people who are making hip hop and EDM and, and the stuff that is beyond the traditional cinematic orchestral film and game store, score style of music that, that our, our sample libraries in the past have appealed to. I think there are, is an enormous number of people who are making beats and tracks like that who wish they could use orchestral sounds and they want to use high quality strings. They want to use high quality brass and choirs and and, and uh, not and just loops, but like play melodies. Loops. Yes, stuff. exactly. Okay. Not just have not just have you know be locked into the hold down a key and and get a phrase that literally anyone could use in anything that they do. There's nothing wrong with that. There's tons of high quality packs and samples and and uh, and products that many of us on our team have worked on in the past and and other things. And that's all. Yeah. Uh, and that's all. It's all great stuff. But I think that there's a lot of people who who consider themselves composers, even if they don't necessarily call themselves composers. They think of they think about these things in terms of they'll hear a melody in their head or they'll hear hear a musical idea that they want to be able to flesh out with authentic samples. And this is their their opportunity to do so without being turned off by, oh, I have to spend how much to even get get in the door. OK, I'll just use I'll just use since they're good enough. Yeah. They they can be, but. The, this is this is an, another option. Uh, one of our biggest things that's just been announced and released and worked on that we're super excited about is just Museo One. Um, and I'd love for us to to clear up what that means exactly and how that is going to continue to um reach forward into the development of Museo and also how we can address any concerns from previous subscribers like especially those that invested in the lifetime license before Museo one existed um and how yeah. we can show up a couple of things yeah, yeah let's say a couple of things really quick if you have purchased a lifetime license you are done giving us money Yep. You have access to all features, all libraries, all content that goes into Museo. Everything we do with that app is yours. Thank you. Right. Thank you for giving all us the foundation. You're, you're wonderful. Applause to you. You don't have to worry about you being undercut by anything. You just have access. So lifetime people, you're amazing. Thank you. It's the best deal. I'll say also the reason we did that, it's kind of like, you know, you guys were investors in a way uh, into this platform because we really wanted to, and we take, we took everything from that and poured it right back into making this thing as great as possible so yeah but we don't we will not sadly um we're not going to offer the lifetime anymore but we were thinking there still are people that want to uh pay a perpetual so we came up with this idea for museo one which is a first installment 
kind of like other companies have done something similar, a, a complete kind of situation. Yes. We do Museo 1, Museo 2, Museo 3. So you get everything that's on the roadmap uh, on that web, on the Museo website, including the key switches and all the multi, multiple microphone positions uh, for, for 300 bucks. So, yeah. and, you, and it's, it's yours for life, you, you know, it's no subscription at all, but there still is a lot of people who are like 300 bucks is a lot of money. So yeah. a 10 bucks a month and uh, you know, and that's been very successful as well. So we're just trying to, we're just trying to listen to what people want to the best of our ability and make that uh, real for them. Possible. Yeah. yeah. Can I, so let me, let me put some borders around this kind of a thing. So Museo one, if you purchase it as a product, it's a product. And you get everything that's on the roadmap, period. So once once we start making stuff that's off the roadmap, that will be available to our subscribers who continually pay every month. But eventually, when that group of sounds, the new sounds, you know, past that Museo One cutoff time, um, gets big enough, we'll offer a Museo Two. Um, now, Museo Two, our intention is to keep it the same price as Museo One, which right now Museo One's on discount for two ninety nine, but it'll be three ninety nine, right? So in a year or in six months or whenever we have that group of samples, they're like, okay, this is a significant upgrade offering. Uh, you can either upgrade from Museo 1 to Museo 2 for a discount. So all of our Museo 1 purchasers will not have to repurchase content. You know, they'll do the whole upgrade fee thing. And anyone who wants to jump in at that point will just get Museo 2. This is a very standard thing that happens across the board with software developers, especially in our space. Think about it like complete. I bought complete six, you know, way, way, way back in the day. It has a certain amount of content. Whoever bought complete 14, you know, over the last couple of months had just bought the exact same amount of content plus everything they've added in those years for basically the same price. They probably paid five or 600 bucks for it like I did. Um, this is the intention with Museo. Museo one, two, three, four, ad infinitum. Okay. So it's very, very simple. We want to keep it really clean. There's really no if, and, or but about it. There's a lot of people who speculate wildly <laughs> on the internet about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. But like from the horse's mouth, Museo 1 is a price. Once we get enough content, we'll release a Museo 2. It'll be the same price and you can upgrade fee. We're not trying to screw anyone here. Like everyone should just have the value for the money that they put in. And we're trying to keep it exactly the same as our competitors, exactly the same as the, what the industry expects. So no wonky harebrained schemes here, just simple. I'll also, I'll take the opportunity to say it's possible to have both a Museo One license and a monthly or annual subscription. So if you have a Museo One license and you don't want to wait for us to package the new content together and it becomes Museo Two and you'll upgrade at that point and get all of it and you want to get the new instruments as they're being released every month, you can have a, an annual membership or a monthly membership and you'll continue to get all of that stuff. It's a great point. The other thing I'll also say is, app features the app itself will always be free to everybody so so mic positions as as shane mentioned those are coming everyone will get those when we add let's, more let's put that into context like really clearly if you purchase museo one today yeah and then in however many months a new feature comes out or an update comes out to one of the libraries that was included say i realize i messed up the tuning on some the on the lure horns well lure, we don't tune lure horns but whatever <laughs> yeah, if, I do, yeah. if i do something and we update it or a new feature is pushed into Museo in months from now or years from now, as a Museo One purchaser, you will get access to the updates and the features that that come later as a purchaser of Museo One. Just make that super, yep. super clear. That also applies to new instruments in a collection that you own. So for example, right. there's more content in Cineharps that we may port to, to Museo in, you know, down the line. Cineharps, the collection, is included in Museo One. So if we add Correct. new instruments to that collection, Museo One users, congratulations, you'll get that when it's available. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah this, this applies to a lot of stuff. There's Portamento for Apocalyptica uh, that I've got mm -hmm. sitting on a drive. Um, there's cool. there's stuff that. across the board that either we didn't have the feature set. Hollywood Winds is a great example. Once we right. get time stretching and pitch bending algorithms in, we'll have a bunch of different content that will go into these. As a Museo One purchaser, you will have access to all those updates. Yep. Okay, so feature talk. Um, can we speak a little bit on key switching, mic positions, time stretching, all of that kind of stuff that we've thought a lot about and we're working on and all, all of that that's coming soon. Let me see, what did Santi just say? 58 new key switch patches that he's pushing to beta. So that's cool. <laughs> lots of Lots of stuff coming. 
Harrison, Harrison. do you want to speak a little bit about? Uh, I, don't, about... I don't want to step on your feature toes. <laughs> I've been patiently waiting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, key switching. I, you know, from developer side of things, uh, I was really happy with how it rolled out. Uh, I'm really grateful to our beta team who worked hard testing it. Um, and, you know, grateful to Shane, Maddie, and the rest of the production team who worked around the clock to get this whole pipeline going. And uh, I, the word pipeline is really important. Um, that's critical to how we develop both features and content in Musio. There's, you know, any new thing probably sits in the pipeline for about a month from the point where, you know, we're, we're starting to wrap up the changes, goes to beta for two weeks and then hits the, uh, it's the production service where you, you know, our customers will see it. Um, so now, uh, you know, there's inevitable bugs and things. So we're really grateful for everyone using the in-app feedback. Uh, I probably am a broken record. You know, I could look at the previous live stream. Um, it is, it is something we threw in that has become the most valuable aspect, I think, of the Museo platform. You being able to directly provide us feedback, suggestions, um, little bug fixes and things like that lets us um, really be agile in how we tackle all our changes. Um, and it also lets us, um, you know, we, we come into developing software with a set of assumptions. Um, a lot of us are, I came from the pro composer world. I had, you know, high expectations of samplers and, um, a bit of my background uh, in Los Angeles, I used to um, co-own a company that would provide tech support for some of the top A-list composers. And I got exposed to a lot of workflows and it's everyone works differently. And we can see that in a lot of the support messages we get in about suggestions or things that people notice, stuff like that. And um it's stuff I've seen before. It's like new uh, suggestions or new system configurations. Um, that's something that I think uh, my eyes were open the biggest when I finally put together a graph of here's every DAW we want to support on every CPU platform of every plugin. It's like the three dimensional box of every way you could use Musio. So. Um, that's where the support comes in super handy. Um, when you submit your logs uh, and sorry, when you click the checkbox, um, you know, you're consenting to submitting your logs, we get a little information on your system, which helps us do this. Um, a lot of this I, I'm trying to bring up as a preface because with those assumptions of professional requirements for things like key switching, um, you know, it was really, really requested. And when I try to take away my assumptions of how key switching operates or, you know, just the like, oh, it's key switching, make it work. You know, everyone knows what key switching is. Um, in the context of Musio, where we have customers that are, so, you know, we have teenagers using Musio who are just exploring a sequencer for the first time. I resonate with that because I was a teenager when I got my hands on GarageBand and you know, you, you're exposed to this world of samplers for the first time. Um, I try to maintain that sort of headspace where it's like someone is going to explore key switching for the very first time. There are no assumptions that are safe for what what is key switching. Um, if I put those assumptions back on, I know probably a majority of CineSamples users Key switching is a way to sequence and switch quickly with one track because you have a workflow that exports to Finale or Sibelius, and it's this whole pipeline. Um, and we do have a stack of additions to add to key switching. Um, for instance, if you've been if you've been playing around the key switching patches in Musio, you'll notice that the key switching octave is limited to twelve notes, C to B. And is always within the playable range of an 88 key keyboard. Um, this is a chance for me as a developer and to represent across our team here to be a little more opinionated. Um, 
key switching in Musio is definitely designed to be a live perf- uh, or I should say a live sequenced element. You could use it for live performance, but I think most of us are at home uh, in our studio bedrooms, <laughs> like myself right now. Music. Yeah, we're not. I don't think anyone's key switched live at a show because that could be that could be disastrous. Yeah, <laughs> if you have, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> But that idea of like, you know, if you're proficient at keyboards and you're familiar with key switches, I'm sure everyone has seen demos by Mike Patty uh, over the years of like, you you can get into a workflow where you're nailing those articulation changes live. So you can get that idea direct from your head to the keyboard into the sequencer back to your ears. Um, so yeah, to reiterate, it it is opinionated in the sense that key switching is a live sequence task. Um, and I know on our beta team, there was a lot of um, a great conversation and back and forth about where does key switching lie in the world of expression maps and mm-hmm. sequencers. And I'm 100% on board with uh, that workflow. Um, it, we originally put out a, a while ago a video um, with some educational material covering, I think, one or two DAWs uh, that says, here's how you can use expression maps with Musio to get the, you know, uh, to to be uh, faster in your sequencer using a single track, working with a workflow that goes to an engraving software, something like that. Um, on the technical detail side, there are still some caveats to that. Um, what you get with Musio's key switching and and other key switching implementations is um, your CCs like uh, modulation or expression. It's really important that those are shared across the potential articulations that you could switch to. To um, I believe a lot of DAW implementations do not transmit CCs evenly or or just just blast them out to the um, the uh, what's what's the switched articulations um it's kind of you know it's kind of a stubborn it's stubborn of me to say that this is the DAWs problem or maybe it should be outside of the sampler um but I'm not just going to settle with you know making that statement and moving on to solve other bugs um our key switch implementation under the hood we use the word articulation switching and key switching is a small part of it. And I can see future updates uh, accommodating different workflows where um, uh, key switching patches are curated. That was a one word we threw out early on that they're chosen by our production team and stapled together, essentially. Like the key switch patch at the top of the collection is built out of all the articulations you would find below it. Um, and that again, taking away the assumptions of like, what is key switching, um, it, in having that one click to load the key switching and a familiar workflow where it's like, this is an instrument I can perform, um, and an instrument built out of already quality controlled existing articulations was the best of all the worlds we, um, we discussed about i think it was well, when did we last meet in person wasn't it january february we yeah, that, yeah. i don't think it was intended to become a key switching or we were just you know reminiscing about like what could we do you know what are we going to focus on this year and all of a sudden we have like a whiteboard full of yeah. <laughs> uh, this is what it could be and this is what it should be and we, we sketched um, out the design that day yeah we basically yeah. did and we found some of the pitfalls of like how how can we properly how how can we quickly create key switching patches in this, you know, it's still its own instrument, you know, one of the, uh, I think I originally pitched it like, well, what if there was like, you know, the rack had a different mode and, yeah. you know, from the lofty developer mind or, you know, a professional setting of a composer where it's like, I know what key switching is. I'm looking for new workflows. I can take my existing workflow and modify it. I, this would be a quagmire for someone new. And um, something I brought up, I remember on our beta discussion forum, um, some, I think the, the biggest mistake we could make is if the user clicks load or it, at any time is like, 
all right, I'm ready to make noise and they press a key and nothing happens. That's a failure on us. Um, I feel like users shouldn't be able to be confused or be like, why isn't this working? What did I miss? Um, I think everyone has been there. There's always like, you know, you turn that knob and like, yeah, this is great, but that track's been muted the whole time. <laughs> Those problems always exist. But um, yeah, this is this is what led to our current key switch implementation. Doors open for additional um, articulation switching. I know CCs were popular when I was working uh, under Composer. That was one of my main tasks, building contact multiscripts that would translate for any uh, channel or key switch system. This Composer really wanted CCs. I could see us supporting that. Um, um, and, but send in your suggestions. If you have a workflow yeah. that you love, send it in. I know one that was requested is a lot of people have a second MIDI controller that they'll assign to the zero or negative range. Um, I, yeah, I think that would be near the top of the list, um, sort of the, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So for those who, you know, I'm actually not gotten... a good enough keyboard player to be able to switch anything while I'm trying to get out an idea. <laughs> so I sketch in like super simple mode, like just shorts and longs. And then I like to assign and program my key switches manually. So for me, having like a C minus two to, you know, C, C zero range, all reserved for key switching, like that's my dream world. But I understand that that's not really the workflow for everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead, Steve. Uh, just quick plug for Dorico, if anyone is using using that. Expression maps within Dorico do send the, the MIDI CC data for your dynamics and expression to yes. all the articulations. So yes, I have a very, uh, I'm very happy with the template that I've set up with that, where I have one instance of Musio per staff in the score, and it has my legato, staccato, staccatissimo, tenuto, mm -hmm. etc. And I can use the notation symbols, and it will follow both dynamic CC1 and expression CC11, because those are standardized in Musio as well. And I put in my crescendos and they go all the way up and they go all the way down and you can even go all the way to Niente. It's awesome. So if you haven't, nice. haven't checked it out, it's a good thing. Yeah, so something I like brainstormed. Get, get on that because yeah, they currently, right. Logic's articulation sets don't don't work for all MIDI channels. You got to put in that on on each one, which is the only drawback that I that I've encountered there. Obviously, right. guys, I mean, to I don't want to interrupt you, Harrison, but not to beat a dead horse of key switching. We think about this and debate about <laughs> this and fight about this and design about this and go back and forth All a lot. The time. Um, the, basically, the thing that you can do to be involved is just submit feedback. Go and start using Musio and submit a ton of feedback. Um, we absolutely take this into consideration, and it does shift our priorities. If we get 30 or 40 or 100 people asking for a certain feature that's going to be very significant to us. And we're going to implement that. You know, this is definitely something that we love to use, but we're building it for the community. So we read every ticket. Yeah, absolutely. We, we and we all every do, single so ticket and we, and we, yeah. Uh, um, just for, just for oh, in case ahead. anyone watching doesn't know what articulation switching is and what articulations are within sampling, just a Cliff Notes version of it. When we record these instruments, we record all the different playing styles, or not all, but many of the different playing styles for short notes and long notes: staccatissimo, staccato, tenuto, sustain. So ta, 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 ta. All the different <laughs> different varieties. Yeah, right. Um, and we and we have those available separately. In Musio, they're currently separated out as different instruments, so you can use the traditional 20-some-year-old workflow of, of loading a different articulation on each track. But as we've been saying, most of the DAWs can now have a system for switching within them, or you can now do it with key switches. So that's that's what we're talking about here, if anyone's been lost for the last few minutes. <laughs> uh, so I'll... Bookend key switches. There's a lot uh, more that's going to come out. Keep an eye out for that. Keep submitting your uh, feedback on that. Um, the next question was about mic positions. Um, and uh, yeah, I mic positions are something that's critical to the history and legacy of Cine samples. Um, it's also a foundational feature in pretty much every orchestral sampling library. It's it's a professional level feature. It's something that fills out the product's offering. Uh, a lot of times it can elevate the price a lot. Um, 
uh, for those who who can use it. Um, we actually before Museo launched, we put in a significant chunk of work to make mic positions or we were using an abstract term blend position because we were thinking it could be beyond microphones in a studio maybe it's like the it's a reverb send or a tape mix or maybe there's a a, 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 a bounced out chorus effect so um we've thought about this we have an implementation that's been read no i won't say ready let's let's throw that word out we experimented with it worked but it fought against what we were trying what the rest of Musia was about um uh the the streamline download would have failed the moment you start tripling and quadrupling sample usage um the entry the the sort of easy learning curve would have somewhat been decimated by all of a sudden all these mic positions on and a user is a new user would be lost in like, well, what is this doing? Or the load on the system, again, scales linearly with the number of mic positions you want to put in. And so we chose to delay the launch of mic positions um, until we got effectively off, off the ground. And we're collecting feedback from users, not so much on mic positions, because that's not something we haven't discussed about uh, I guess the last live stream we had some images that went out that kind of cover the basics of what people would expect um, choosing your mic positions enabling them downloading them we've got a little bit of feedback of people um, responding to that speculating and we've packaged that for when we're ready to put the uh, final pin in mic positions um, the things we're trying to balance there from from my perspective as like the producer of this is we don't want to destroy the fast, agile workflow that is Museo. So there's never going to be a world where you click something and you have to wait for like every single mic position to download and you just have to wait. Um, <clears throat> I think mic positions gen for most people, and I would even include professionals in this, but for like 90% of composers, mic positions are just rope to hang yourself with. A good full mix is going to get 90% of people 99% of the way there. So um, it's certainly not as important as a lot of people make it out to be, but we have all these mic positions and they are useful for very particular workflows. So what we've done is we've designed a way to make it very quick and agile for you to load and make music, load sounds and make music. And if you need that, then you can make additional clicks and additional decisions to download extra mic positions. But we're not trying to slam your hard drive with excessive amounts of stuff. We're not trying to get all these things triggering all at the same time we just want to make music <laughs> like make music and then we can deal with that kind of stuff later so that's why it's been a little bit lower um on the priority list than functional stuff like key switches and updates mm -hmm. yeah okay. so i think the question everyone's on the back of their mind or the tip of their tongue is when is mic positions going to come out in museo um and i'm scanning everyone in the zoom Am I going to say it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it, Harrison. You're a young man. <laughs> yeah. As, as a developer on the team here at Museo, I'm, I'm a firm believer in under promise and over deliver. So we're, we're looking at early next year as an effective time to polish both the software implementation and let the production team catch up and make sure that all the instruments and and like this isn't you know key switching was 40 50 60 instruments because we have a workflow that combines them it's nice that 15 articulations becomes one key switch but mic positions affects every single instrument in museo there are mic positions for now 1600 plus instruments that are going to have to be updated and that probably, be probably probably over 2000 by the end of the year there you go so um you know we're we like the progressive way that we implement changes again this pipeline keeps us focused on staying agile to the feedback we get and uh we also depend on that feedback for incrementally adding a feature uh here's something that we Either we didn't consider the beta team didn't catch and we can immediately be like, this is critical. Let's put it in the pipeline immediately. Yeah. Um, so kind of progressive rollout means that um, 
you know, mic positions are launched. Here is the core set of Cine Symphony and everything else comes out along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so speaking of mic positions and um, how we have aimed to keep things as lightweight as possible. We've had a couple questions about um, drive space and one very unfortunate situation. I'm very uh, sorry to Ronnie B. He says, hey guys, my worst nightmare came true. My computer died and I had to build a new one. Um, do I need to download everything again or can I point to the drive that has the samples? Um, quick That's, answer for yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't think we have official material on like what's going on behind the scenes with downloads. Um, and I'll take this opportunity to try and blitz through it. So when you download an instrument, there are two parts. The first part is what we call an IDF instrument definition format. Yeah, it's, it's not redundant. Uh, instrument definition format, that is the logic of the instrument. And those are stored in your OS drive. They're small, um, compressed. They're like, I think the biggest instrument we've built are probably some of, it's not released. The multi-mic version of like Piano and Blue is, it can get up to a couple megabytes because that's uh, thousands and thousands of samples. Um, uh, legato instruments usually tend to be large IDF files. Um, so those files live on your OS drive. If you're rebuilding your computer, you have to always re-download those. They're, they're tied to your user account. Um, and again, because they're so small, they're quick to download. The samples are the second part. Now, by default, those also install to a shared folder in your o your main OS drive. Um, Museo Connect can change where that location is. Um, for professional users out there, run your install, immediately go to Museo Connect and change that location to your you know solid state drive or external drive if you use multiple computers. Um, and then all your downloads will go to that drive. Uh, if you've already downloaded a bunch, the tool will migrate it for you. Um, please don't move your samples manually. Uh, the, it was something we originally said, like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna try to white glove this situation. But I know a lot of our professionals are used to just, oh, I'm in the finder, I'll just drag and drop. So we've made it more robust to those who want to manually move it. Um, Musio used to get confused and be like, hey, there's no samples here. Um, but now Musio, whenever you're changing that sample directory, it respects the files that are already in there. And the next step is if you are in the situation where you're rebuilding it, first thing you want to do is install Musio, load Musio Connect, point it to the existing downloaded samples. Um, and let Musio Connect know that that's where they live. Um, then when you launch Musio, you'll see that in the catalog, there are no instruments downloaded. And in that case, it's because the instrument download status is built on that first component, the IDFs. So if it doesn't see those, it says, oh, you don't have anything downloaded. Don't panic. When you click load, you will notice that the download is almost instant because It'll download that IDF, check the requirements for samples, scan your sample directory, uh, skip to go collect $400 or $200, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, I've tested this. Uh, I'm switching accounts a lot, and that means my IDF file gets blown out. But I have my external SSD with a complete set of Museo samples. And I can load up a logic session that we have around the company that has all the instruments on it. And yeah, I'll just watch it blitz through every download and get loaded. Um, so I think the, the big takeaway here is don't panic when you don't see downloaded instruments. If you have a known sample drive, let Musio Connect know where it is. And then continue using Musio. Don't uh, I know we've gotten feedback from one user who is like, oh, I had to spend time clicking all the downloads uh, to get it ready. And I, uh, my best advice is Musio is there to be your best friend in handling that for you. I would say just open your session. Yeah. It has all your Musio instruments loaded um, and or saved, I should say. And then Musio will just 
take off try, and and trying to it's just saying hey you need these instruments i got it i'm going to fetch them all for you we have bob asking if you can have multiple hard drive locations and split sample locations as the sample pool grows is that yeah this is a good question um we have notes and stubbed implementations for this um if you dive you know looking into the hood it is something we've thought about um, it's not implemented yet, mostly because it is a user experience, uh, a bit of a quagmire for especially, again, those at the beginning of the learning curve, understanding what, you know, why would I split my samples, which drives have different performance capabilities. Uh, for the most part, Musio does perform well on hard drives, um, but we're also living in 2023 where solid state drives are pretty accessible to everyone. I think uh, USB-C external one terabyte SSD is $49. Now. I remember my first SSD was $400 yeah. for 200 gigabytes. For Zerk. Um, so it's, we're kind of in a golden age of storage. We try to keep that in mind at Museo. It's kind of like a behind the scenes platitude for the dev team that like storage is relatively cheap and fast. Um, so yes, for those who have a lot of samples and want to manually manage them, it is on the to-do list. It's not the biggest priority for us, but please submit feedback. Let us know why uh, you need it for your workflow, or maybe you're in a pinch of just like, hey, here's here's why this works for me. Um, because that will also help inform how the user experience or the user interface for that should work. Um, yeah, your feedback doesn't just drive features and dev, it totally drives design, UI, UX 100%. decisions that we make. We, re we literally, re I, can't, I don't think we can iterate this or reiterate this enough. We read every single piece of feedback that is submitted. And when I say we, I mean like all of us. We have a running channel in our company Slack that just pops up. I'm looking at, even if I'm at lunch and my phone will ding with your feedback and I will look at it immediately. It will shape the way that this that this app is built and our stuff is implemented. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's um, it informs everyone and it also empowers the whole team to. Um, not everyone responds to it. It's Steve and his team that you're communicating with, but we'll have a running thread of comments on like here's I'll, I'll usually be watching pitching in technical comments um, that the support team will forward to you. So. Yeah, multi drives, it'd be great. Um, it's just a bit lower on the to do list because we're a bit stumped on the best path forward for user experience. On the subject of hard drive space, I just checked how much, uh, what the footprint is. It's 240 gigabytes for the entire everything right now. Uh, and something else that's cool that we that we didn't mention in the key switch discussion, the key switch patches, as you see them in, in the Museo instrument list, they'll say 1.2 gigabytes, 1. Point whatever gigabytes. They don't actually, if you already have those, the included articulations downloaded, it won't increase. Like you don't need to download another gigabyte of samples. It'll use the, the samples for those articulations that you already have downloaded. If you don't have any of them downloaded, it will, but, but yeah, you're not, you're not increasing the footprint by adding the key switch patches, even though it says. So yeah, when we add these 58 some key switch patches that are, that are about to get to beta in a few weeks, um, you won't have another 60 gigabytes to download. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big, big part of the milestone of work for key switching was I have, you know, the user story. I've downloaded everything in Museo. Why am I waiting to download right. all this? You know, at the at the end of the day, Museo Connect, if anyone's explored the Museo samples directory, you're greeted with gibberish. It's it's <laughs> letters and numbers uh, that are a mile long. And that's because all of these samples have been um, uh, have been hashed to make sure that the, if multiple instruments use the same sample, it's on your hard drive once. So um, to sort of shore up that workflow, we you know basically reprocessed how all the samples are stored on the service to make sure that you have quick downloads on that reuse. Let's get through some more questions faster because I'm dying for this tech talk. <laughs> we, do like a, we do like a lightning round where we just let's do it. Yeah, let's just do like yes or no bunch of blitz questions. Go for sure. it. Uh, this one is for Mike. Um, just 
uh, James asked a couple times, um, just the original concept of third parties being in Museo. Has there been any future discussion of that or what, what's the idea around that? No, we're, pro we're focusing just on Senna samples right now. Um, yeah, there's no plans for that in, in the future. Yeah. We, we got enough on our plate. <laughs> yeah. Um, Will, can we talk a little bit about tempo syncing for libraries like Hollywood Winds and? I'll talk to this real quick. We got all the samples. We were making good calls with Hollywood Winds and things like that on what we should put in before tempo syncing is available. Um, it's not, it's, it's higher on our priority list, but it's not the highest. So certainly key switch implementation and support, um, multi-mic positions, things like this are going to go in before tempo syncing. The plan is absolutely to include it. Um, we just want to do it well. And um, that kind of content is just so available and so cheap and everything like that, that it's not huge on the music priority list. But yeah, plan for sure. The last time we did a live I believe if I remember correctly, we kind of pulled back the curtain a little bit on some visuals of design and things yeah. that were forward. Um, is there any potential for us to be able to peel the curtain back a little bit and show anything right now? Or are we keeping stuff? Yeah. No, 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 I can, uh, you wanna, you guys wanna see download all buttons and a little bit of catalog organization? Yeah, we've been having fun with it. And I think it'd be, it would be fun. It's always, Always fun to show you guys what we're working on behind the scenes. Let's just share my Google Chrome tab. So this is a representation of Gina Luciani Flute Library, which is the best flute library in the whole world. And she's the best flute player in the whole world. You should go buy Musio just for this. <laughs> in fact, Musio at two ninety nine is worth it if only if if this is the only library you got. So just FYI, um, what we found is that when you go through um, a library, Gina Luciani recorded four flutes. Uh, and there's, I think, near 100 patches, near 100 articulations. So you're kind of like doom scrolling. What was that, Steve? 137. 137 different articulations across the flutes and the ensemble patches that we built. Um, it's like doom scrolling through Instagram, trying to get to the bottom, you know, and we don't want people to just find out that there's a contrabass flute, you know, after months of using this thing. So uh, this is the current representation. Um, when you click into a catalog or into a collection, this will be the newer one. So you'll see just a very short list of available instruments that you can click on. When clicked on, uh, they will accordion out like this. Obviously, this will be a little bit longer. There's a lot more articulations for alto flute than just five. Um, I think there's something like 35 or something like that, but they'll accordion out and you'll notice a couple things here. We've got a master macro switch to easily, you know, close and open the accordion. And we've got this sexy new button for the download all. Um, we're not going to do a download all collection like capital C collection, but we will do a download all instrument. Uh, we, there's a couple of reasons why, but mostly we're thinking about uh, user experience. We don't want you to accidentally get locked in into like tons and tons of content downloads or not having it bespoke. And um, this is a really simple and slick solution. I might not want ensemble samples and you shouldn't have to be forced to download them. So uh, this is a quick button. When you mouse over, this will pop up and you'll just click download and it will automatically download all the articulations in that instrument. So this is fun for us. We just kind of lock this in and we're getting that we're getting that put together and, and wrapped up. Hopefully we'll be rolling that out soon. But uh, that's basically what I can share today. I anything else? I mean, I can, I got, we, we got lots of designs, guys. <laughs> can we show anything about um, uh, key switching? We just have a couple of questions about what that. Yeah, what specifically? I mean, you can use it right now. In, yeah. In um, Poster says, how will key switches be shown in this new instrument list? I like how the key switches are accessible at the top. Um, those will be right at the, oh, that's a good question. So those will be right at the top here. So when you click on alto flute, you'll see the list of key switch options under alto flute for something like this, you might have two key switches, like one or three, like one for all one for sketch and one for effects or something like that. You know, we have a lot of creative ways to put together different key switch sets. Um, in the future, we might do like custom key switch building. We don't know, but they'll just pop up right underneath their instrument group. Cool. Is there anything uh, else? Yeah, anything else? That we or is that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can show it again, but the multi mic positions is something like this. Uh, when we when we actually get them, you'll you'll see a mixer, and we have you know options to download individual more mixes if you want to load them and purge them and turn them on and off, things like this. 
Um, these are not locked in, but this is the going design and it's it's becoming more and more locked in as we as we get closer to that implementation. Um, you know, time, time stretching, pitch bending, things like that, that will be behind the scenes. You won't even know that it's happening. It's just going to work. Um, other than that, I mean, this is like the catalog refresh because we just don't want to, you know, have to scroll through a ton of stuff. But, you know, we're looking ahead into how do we make Museo better all the time. So I, we love all your feedback, all the feedback that we get about how this top bar should function and some of the bugs that we've seen on like the catalog remembering your place and stuff like that. All that stuff is getting fixed. So that's just kind of an FYI. Cool. Great. Uh, we can go back to a couple more rapid. I mean, more than more than anything, I want people to see this. I was going to say, yeah. Where's <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when we get stuck on something and we don't want to fix it. So, <laughs> well, last time we shared, we had the accidental slip of sassy clock. So, oh yeah, <laughs> little Easter eggs in there every time now. <laughs> we have fun with it. Okay, next, more questions. Yeah. Um, so Cheddar Egg is asking if there's a sneak peek at all of 2024 libraries. Um, I mean, we don't even know all of 2024 yeah, libraries. <laughs> First of all, Cheddar Egg, I love you. <laughs> You're like my favorite beta tester and everything. He's like also like running our chat. He's like answering questions yeah. for us. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we owe you a Starbucks gift card or something. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, we... We can definitely talk about some things that we've got in the bag that we just love. Our World Series obviously is coming, and those things have just been a labor of love since the beginning, but they're turning out into just really, really wonderful instruments that we love. Um, we've got a bunch of soundscapey, textury things coming. I've got a, a buddy of mine in LA who's just recorded a bunch of um, like world sounds, rain and near a lake and in a forest and all these kinds of things. And those things will be not only given to you just for documentary style writing, you know, when you have a, a scene of a road, you know, that's in the desert, you need kind of like environment sounds and all this stuff composers and producers should have access to this we're not just like the violin people and the brass people like we should be people who make sounds for everything of all music and sound creation so that stuff is going in we'll be stretching the hell out of that stuff and making it all textural and layered um we've got tons of plans for doing like kind of an augmented series um we have so many synth sounds and so many orchestral sounds and so many bizarre kind of random stuff, deep, low brass mixed with synthesizers mixed with contrabass flute. I want to know what that sounds like in an ensemble patch. So um, we have a lot of like kind of get high on your own supply <laughs> instruments coming in the future where it's just music creation tools that you don't have to build yourself. Um, there's a bunch of legacy stuff, uh, Cine Legacy percussion that Mike recorded in a garage, like at the beginning of uh cine samples you know production they sound great so toms cymbals and snares i believe uh mm -hmm. those will be getting in cine bells uh which doesn't have any bells in it but has awesome bell-like tones we're rebranding as colors and we're getting that in uh taylor davis is on the docket to get in as an artist series um there's just a lot of stuff our roadmap does not include so much of the stuff that's just sitting on our drive um that's just getting ready so we're trying to just say this is our priorities this is what we're working on right now the rest will come but there's a lot there's a lot since we've been porting everything from cine samples over into museo we do have a couple questions asking about what the future of cine samples is will it be phased out what's going on with it what can people expect with that i mean i can go from my perspective where mike can answer this one but i don't know if phased out is the right thing it's not like museo and cine samples fight each other uh, Museo is a player that CineSamples uses to get its content out there. The value of CineSamples is that we've gone to excellent places and we've found excellent people to record excellent sounds. And the way that we deliver those shouldn't really matter. Museo is the cheapest, fastest, most effective, most user-friendly way to do that. Um, so in that sense, Museo will absolutely be uh, the, the main way that we deliver those instruments it's it's the best <laughs> it's the cheapest it's the most user-friendly all of those things um so cine samples does not equal contact cine samples equals our samples it equals our production style it equals our sound that we capture and is unique you know so those kinds of things i, I think i think yeah. we'll find that if we're successful with serving composers with museo then there will be less of a need to keep supporting the old school way of doing samples through contact and these large monolithic files. Um, and so that's because we are, look, I mean, some insider baseball here, we're, we're a small team. So you have to consider, 
you have to focus. Um, and I think when we were first starting this a couple of years ago, um, we were split between Cine samples, contact instruments, and building out Musio. And it's almost like everybody on the team had two jobs. It was really insane. <laughs> and as of early this year, we just made the decision we're going all in on Musio, which is a kind of a risky move, right? Because for 16 years, Cine samples is the thing that kind of paid the bills. Uh, but we're we're taking a big leap here, and, and I believe it's going to pay off. Um, focus is a huge part of this. Yeah. Mike, from the perspective of being the founder of, of Cine Samples and Museo and really diving in hardcore to the development of Museo, um, what have been some of the things that have caught you by surprise from vision to fruition and things that you, uh, yeah, never, never would have expected things that get you super excited. Um, just speaking on that a little bit, I think would be fun for you. Yeah. Well, first of all, if anybody wants to do something like this, just understand that it takes longer than you expect. <laughs> you need an enormous, we all need an enormous amount of patience. Um, software is, uh, is a long slog and, and, um, that's one of the things that I, I think all of us thought it was going to be a lot faster, right? Right. Harrison, when we started this four years ago, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for me, it's just like watching the team build this thing. And then there's a new iteration and each new version, it's just like, it's exciting. Like every time there's like a new feature or the key switching is now in, I mean, there's a little bit of like, it's like Christmas morning <laughs> every couple of weeks. Um, Cause you know, when you start something like this, it's just a, it's just an idea in your head in a, you know, on a, or on a scratch of paper. Um, and, uh, and the key is to put together a really awesome team. Um, don't tell them, but yeah, they, they are an awesome team. And I would never say this to their face, but they're an awesome <laughs> team. <laughs> and gifted me both. So, yeah, it's, uh, fun. it's, it's been fun to watch this thing grow and, and build and certainly, you know, it's certainly stressful. It's an interesting time in the market. Um, I'm sure everyone sees all of the sales going on with all of our competitors who are doing these 40, 50, 70% off sales in some cases. And um, it's just, that's sort of a signal just to say that the way the things have been are, are, are coming to an end. And so this is our take at, at you know, looking into the future uh, and, and preparing for what's to come, which is, I think we're going to see a lot more companies doing similar things to us. But I think we're probably one of the first to do something like this, where you just get everything all in one, um, one plugin. So yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a challenging thing. You're basically, you know, you're stepping into the void. You don't know what the future looks like, but you just take those risks and those choices and you go for it. Yeah. So. Um, I've seen a couple questions come up throughout this whole hour of um, just curiosity from some of our users to learn from those of us on the team, especially with orchestration. And um, Paul just recently asked, will Mike ever do an orchestration course for Cine Sample slash Museo? And we also had a question previously that I can't find asking about um, Amanda and or Steve also doing something similar. So is there a future for that on the Museo, Museo team for for educational things. Yeah, like. when we have time. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. I can speak to this. This is something that that my team has had on our uh, on our in our minds and in our backlog for uh, quite some time. Uh, I have the enormous pleasure of working with a couple of people who just went through USC's uh, screen scoring program, which several other people on the team have gone through uh, in the past. But they're fresh out of it and and really excited to share their. Um, their knowledge and, and what they've learned and uh, through the lens of how to work with Museo for for these orchestrational concepts. And uh, that's something that we're really excited to get going. We think it's an enormous opportunity to, to use to educate people. And for, as I said earlier, uh, for people to learn who are new to these things and have access to everything they may need and have all of the instruments they need to mock up a certain score and be able to get started right away and not be able to say, oh, okay, I can get most of the way there, but I'll need to use this for that, or I'll need to use an ensemble patch for that, or I'll, I don't have a second flute available, so I'll, I guess I'll just, you know, guess I'll just not. Um, but today it's it's pretty comprehensive. I mean, you can you can basically point to, to most classical scores or, or film scores, and if you want to do a mock-up of it with Museo, it's pretty available. 
Yeah. Uh, to, to the educational thing, though, if you guys want to see like more demos that include the how I wrote this, like how the sausage sort of gets made in the composition side, um, we'll just tell them. I'm sure Amanda, Amanda's a great teacher. She used to yeah. lead lines for collegiate uh, groups and, and all this different stuff. So she's a fantastic presenter and really, really gifted composer as well. And um, if you guys like want that, that's a great platform for us to share what Museo can do and sort of the width and breadth of the catalog. So um, the more that we make demos and the more that we do content and produce content, we'll just gear it more towards the educational thing when the time comes, you know, right now we're just focused more like on marketing. I, I've, I've read in a few forums where people are like, oh, marketing, like, oh, I know, I know that there's like this big knock against corporate marketing and people just, especially the people who are really in our industry and in our community are like, why are you acting like this big multi-million dollar company and blah, blah, blah. And let me just say, like, we have to keep the lights on. We have to keep the computers working. You know, we got to keep people paid and fed and housed. Um, and a lot of that is marketing to the masses and just kind of trying to stay afloat. And those, there's a reason why it's really loud and really colorful and really quick and basic and all these different things. And I think this community that is like here on these kinds of live streams are generally the more invested. They're generally the more interested. They don't really need all the flash and pizzazz and stuff like that, but it is necessary for marketing for a company to remain solvent in the social media world that we find ourselves in. So um, I think we're making good calls on that side and we're doing our best. We try to not mislead or not overblow or anything like that. But um, when there is an opportunity to kind of depart from that and say, hey, okay, let's cater to our more core base and stuff and be a little bit more educational and intentional about that content, we will make opportunities to do that. I will also say our, our head of marketing has brought that up in, in several meetings over the past few months that the most successful that we see things doing is when they are more education focused and when we have people who are outside the company creating tutorials and, and creating uh, you know videos that they are focusing on an orchestration technique or how to orchestrate and they're using Museo to do it. That ends up getting us a lot of new free trials and, and word of mouth and a lot of excitement. So it's not lost on our marketing department in particular that that is, that is uh, highly effective. Uh, and, and that's what people really want to see more than anything else. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, do we have time for a couple more rapid fire questions? Or are we yeah, let's, let's keep it going. Good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Jonas asks, are you going to implement a way of adjusting the velocity response on plucked instruments slash pianos? On, on the Great on the question. docket. Yeah, we definitely want velocity curves implemented. Um, we're just trying to get some of the bigger heavy hitters out of the way. Cool. Uh, Keith asked if there's any change of um, adding MIDI scripting capability to Museo. Great MIDI question. scripting capability? Like a custom yeah. script. Yeah. So user scripting... Uh, Ooh. Pretty low like, on the priority right the now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think no. the best, no. yeah, scripted, I, scripted functionality. What do they mean? That's, like, because because Museo has a custom uh, scripting language, right? That we haven't really taken full advantage of. We we take a lot of advantage of it. A lot of people don't realize that, but Legato's obviously run on a script. So do Tenuto's short releases and stuff like that. All run on a script. Piano and Blue is awesome because of a timing short release script. Um, there's lots of stuff that's going on there, but we don't want to implement like a user scripting or anything mm. like that right now. If that's mm -hmm. what you mean by MIDI scripting, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. A, a couple, I'll, I'll be brief with this. Um, yes, we definitely leverage our internal scripting. Big difference you'll see in Museo and Contact is all those contact interf interfaces are designed and built on scripting. That was something we wanted to cut out. So all of our interfaces are very standardized very easy for the production team to set up. There's there's no debugging or any workload involved. It's very cookie cutter placement. In fact, placement is automatic. Um, user scripting, I definitely built a bit of a small career early on because I was good at multi-scripting and contact. And like I said, I could basically turn CCs into key switches or whatever. I would argue that that should fall in the DAW's responsibility. A lot of these DAWs have transformers. Uh, I know, like I use Logic that has their own JavaScript script front end. Um, yeah. I would lean into that before we kind of add another potential yeah. foot gun into Museo. To add to plug into that, I see another question about remapping percussion instruments to pads and stuff. Um, that should not really be Museo's responsibility. That should be the responsibility of the controller. 
and it can almost always happen. Like even my little, you know, $40 Akai guy back here, I can map all my pads to different percussions if I want to do that. Um, it's a little bit of a silly thing for us. To, I mean, maybe in the future, but I think it's a little silly for us to tackle it on our side when there's already so many options for, you know, pad hardware to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think, I think the overall, uh, the common thread in a lot of answers of why we haven't done something that maybe seems entry level or common is it always comes down to what is the user experience or interface it is the thing we um spend the most time and delicacy like trying to find the best solution that satisfies all of us and uh our beta team as well awesome uh, we have a payment question is there a possible way to pay with paypal in the future yeah, uh, unfortunately, no. We chose with Stripe, and Stripe and PayPal, I assume, are mortal enemies. That is not supported, unfortunately. Um, an alternative, though, is I know, and Steve can attest to this, a lot of our PayPal users are based in Europe. Europe is less of a credit card-based uh, commercial zone as compared to North America. So we are trying to take advantage of all the Stripe options to have localized payment, like Ideal. Um, I think Klarna was one on there. Um, so so I, they all have a really gyro pay, so, SOFA. Um, so please, uh, what, you'll, what you want to look out for is when you're checking out through the Museo portal, uh, you're going to see the Stripe provided checkout page. There should be a slew of options on top. Let us know what you see. Let us know what you want to pay with. Um, it's an ongoing effort to make sure that those payment options are supported. Um, through Stripe, credit cards are the fastest and uh, I won't say easiest, but it, it is the quickest transaction. So the moment you pay, that license hits your account immediately. Some of the other ones have some more hurdles to jump through or timings. It may take up to half a day to process that. So. For those that are um, Museo 1 members asking about the future of whenever and whatever Museo 2 is, is there any, um, can we speak at all on the pricing of what the next tier would be? Is it going to be Who based knows? off of content? Yeah, we, we don't know yet. It's good. No it's, way of knowing? It, it'll be less than the full price of the thing, but we, we, but we have no idea what the number will be. And we'll only get ourselves in trouble by trying to say a number at this stage. I mean, we don't really know depends. what content will be. The cool thing is that we can kind of decide um, if we make it a smaller offering and we do it in more increments. That's cool. Like if we have enough cool content, like by the end of the first quarter or second quarter of next year, then maybe we do a slightly cheaper one. You know, if we wait until the end of next year to do another one, maybe we don't. I don't know. Uh, it may or may not be more than the price of an annual sub, too. So, yeah, it's certainly not a problem that we're trying to, you know, solve right now. <laughs> no. Just yeah. curiosities. Uh, Big MT Brain asks, uh, as far as AI goes and our considerations of such, um, what kind of brainstorming have we done about how and if and what implementation we would have of AI? Uh, I have some comments, but, but yeah, <laughs> go ahead, Mike. <laughs> thought about it a lot, but I think, um, well, we haven't made any efforts yet to, to really anything concrete. It's probably something that we'll have to consider, but the way we'd want to do it is a way that where your um, museo is like an assistant to you, you know, can help you fill in the blanks or can, you know, go from the empty page problem where you can at least have a starting point for something, but you don't take the human out of the equation. Because I just don't think, I mean, I have no desire. I don't think anyone here has a desire to just create a platform that generates music um, without real human uh interaction so um i i would love to have something where and i did talk about this on twitter a little bit where perhaps you can chat with it you know and type in like i need an action piece you know it'll know you're you know it's, i'm at 160 bpm i need it to be with big drums and and strings and uh you know it needs to be 16 bars at four four whatever you know or, or it could be even more uh creative language and then it just gives you a midi file that you can just drag right into your sequencer so i mean uh, you know we're, we're we've sketched ideas and sort of dreaming up ideas but it really comes down to executing and 
Uh, right now, we, we have our plate full with just getting the key switching and all that stuff done first, because that's our customer is human composers. So yeah. we want to stick there for now. You know, you know. Awesome. yeah, a uh, huge AI fan. I'll just say that, but you know, there might be a way for us to do it in a way that's like really cool. It doesn't, you know, delete the human. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, Mike, you were talking uh, that falls under the generative AI category. I think what everyone has seen in sort of the latest hype cycle is what ChatGPT can do, what MidJourney and Stable Diffusion can do. Yeah. Yeah. Some ideas of like... <laughs> some ideas, just having some fun with it. You know, mm -hmm. perhaps the chat function is, is powered by the ChatGPT API. Um, and the, really the question is having it spit out MIDI. It's, it's just generating silent MIDI that is associated with the instruments in Musio. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, certainly an idea. It really comes out. Is that what yeah. you guys want? It's, I mean, custom, we're a customer-oriented company. So, yeah. uh, The only thing I'll say from a production standpoint is we don't want to also destroy the community that we're a part of and want to support. So any AI that I would be comfortable with would just be a, a helper tool. Um, like, I understand that, like, you guys are who are professionals and who are working, you're going to get asked stuff that's outside of your scope. And you're like, I don't know how to write Bossa Nova. I don't know how to write whatever it is, but I need this job and they, I, I've got talent. So like, let me figure out how to do this. Can I get a little help? Can I get a little direction? Can I get a chord progression for this style of music? Or can I get a chord progression for this culture, you know, segment of music? Is this how they write? And then you can start to do that stuff. We don't want to go the route of like, anyone can compose press button get thing and then like destroy the industry and creativity i don't want to hear content like that when i'm shopping i don't want to hear content like that when i'm watching tv or films like i want you guys to be making music so um yeah that's that's the that's the yeah. boundaries i think that we exist in yeah i i have brainstormed a little bit on how ai or or maybe the better title for it would be machine learning could fit into Musio, and uh, so far it's always been like not on the user's computer. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we showed like some ideas of what generative AI could do to assist you on your computer, but there's a ton of space that could be um, human tedium that could be replaced with machine learning when we get into concepts like denoising, or if you're trying to nail that perfect gain curve uh that could be an iterative process where the machine learning just iterates and says here's my here's the best curve that i think and then hand it off to to one of shane's team members to take it to the finish line i, I always see it on the company side on the offline side where it can really shine mm. I think that's a really great place to wrap this thing up. Um, and if there were any questions that were missed, uh, we're so happy to engage with you guys on social media, send us emails. We always want to be talking like this, whether or not we're in a live stream. Um, but it is so fun to be able to talk with you guys, you all in a, in a live format and, and yeah, chat. And I'll jump through sometime later, either today or tomorrow or over the weekend. I always go back through the questions in the live stream and I'll just answer rapid fire things that, so thank you all for your questions. We don't want to ignore anything and we're not like seeing questions and intentionally passing them by. It's just like, we talk too much maybe. <laughs> so um, I'll It'll go back through it and I'll give good uh, solid answers to any questions that, that we may have missed. Um, yeah. Spam that feedback button too. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Cool. Thanks everybody for coming and yeah, cool. listening. Yeah, thanks. thanks for See you at the next one. <laughs> yeah. Cheers.